good game, boy. But the game is finished. Now you die. Welcome, everyone, to another great episode of Half Glass Gaming. I am, of course, Julian Lucas Pate Watkins Sr. the third. I don't think you're actually all of those things. It's a lineage. You may as well throw a doctor on there if you're gonna you're gonna go that far. <laughs> I don't want to brag, but you know I'm a sir. Also, I'm a knight. <laughs> it just happens. You're walking down the street and a sword touches your shoulder. And... <laughs> I consider that knighting. So while we're still on a serious note, I'd like to introduce everybody. Joined always, am I? Reverend. I, I am I'm actually am a reverend, unlike all the titles Julian made up. Well, I am a deacon. I didn't want to get into You're that, deacon now. but uh, I have been. Uh, are you are you also Esquire? No, I refuse that title. <laughs> you just practice law without the title then. <laughs> I do. <laughs> yeah, I've ruined lives. <laughs> <laughs> and of course we have Mandy. Hey. Hey. And Josh. I'm Josh. He's just Josh. Until proven guilty. N- until proven other. Until proven not Josh. <laughs> he is Josh. Yeah. Welcome everybody to Half Glass Gaming. So uh, I got this uh, book in front of me. I noticed uh, appears to be some sort of a diary. No, at the start of the year, I got it in my head that I wanted to keep a video game log book of just every single game I played. Mm-hmm. It's really more about how at the end of the year I want to have hard data on all the games I played so I can look at it and see like how many games I beat, how many games I played for the first time, mm-hmm. how many games I played at all. Now, do you make year. notations as to uh, whether or not you completed the game? She has a whole series of symbols. Yeah, a check there. Yeah, she check uses. means I beat the game. Mm-hmm. Star means I played it for the first time this year. I haven't had to use this one yet, but a star with a circle will be a game that I played for the first time this year that also came out this year. Ah. Josh copied me. Yeah, I, I had decided to do the same thing, inspired by by Mandy's mm-hmm. brilliant idea. And for the entire first week of my journal, it was Minecraft and Battlefront. <laughs> that's, that's better than me. I don't keep a journal because it's all Skyrim. No, Josh is like asking me like, hey, man, did you remember what I played on Thursday? And I'm like, my, Minecraft and Battlefront. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, yeah. I, I, I've been trying to play Minecraft too, but uh, Josh doesn't want to play split screen with me anymore. So instead of playing separately and having to voice chat. We decided to try something new. Yeah, no. <laughs> not so, because I'm a cantankerous old fool. I don't, that's not what I meant to imply. <laughs> Although there is a little bit of, of that in there. So I, I was trying to do remote play Minecraft on my Vita. And the first time we did it, it actually worked out really well. Mm-hmm. So we could sit next to each other and both play and not have to share a screen so in remote play yeah it's it's you're on the same game yeah but it's as if you were well i'm playing on my ps4 Mm -hmm. which is in the apartment i have a ps4 and then manny brought her a a ps4 over so there's two ps4s in my apartment but they're Mm -hmm. not in the same room and there's only one television and (laughs) (laughs) we could play together in minecraft but she would either have to bring like we would have to move everything yep or we would have to play in separate rooms yep. and then we couldn't talk. Voice chat in the same mm-hmm. room. Or we would have to like voice chat and wear headsets or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so the solution we came up with was let's try this uh, remote play thing on the Vita because I tried it when it first came out yep. and it was um, the first two games that used it were the God of War collection and the Shadow of the Colossus and Ico collection. Mm-hmm. And so I played a little bit of God of War because someone was borrowing my Shadow of the Colossus collection. And so I played a little bit of that and tested it. It was like the day it came out and there was a patch on the PS3 that let you do it. Mm-hmm. They've come a long way and you can do it with a huge <coughs> selection of PS4 games now. Yeah. And I hadn't tried it since way back in the day because it wasn't a very good experience it was very leggy and Mm. and gross back then and it sounds like it's a lot smoother of an experience although mandy and i haven't had that great of an experience with it yet it worked fine the first time and then there was some psn downtime and some psn issues and ever since that started i just try for a couple minutes and i get booted well now you say a good selection of games but i mean it's every game isn't it on the ps4 yeah 
and the PS3, it's a limited. You're literally selection. just using the Vita to broadcast yeah. the PS4, right? Yeah, and the yeah, PS3, uh, it's a limited selection of games, but on the PS4, you're, it's just whatever. Mm-hmm. So it's not working for you, huh? No, not with Minecraft. The only other thing I've played with the remote play is Disgaea 5, mm-hmm. and that worked okay. Yeah, I tried playing The Witcher 3. It's just the the layout of the controls just was not worth it. You just couldn't use it. In Minecraft, I crouched, and I couldn't figure out how to uncrouch. Mm-hmm. I had to go in the other room to uncrouch and then come back. <laughs> Fallout 4, um, they actually created a control scheme that was specifically mapped and designed for remote play, which is great. It works really, really well, except the game is super laggy and it's not worth playing, unfortunately. I don't have a Vita. I have a a PSP, though, that I still really absolutely adore. Mm -hmm. The last time I really played was my PSP in depth. I had bought Resident Evil 3 and I was really excited. I'm like, yay, I get to play Resident Evil 3 handheld because Mm -hmm. I love Resident Evil 3. And it was letterboxed. And I'm like, I can bear. And like Resident Evil is one of those games where you kind of have to see the background to Mm -hmm. see, you know, if there's an item. So I'm like, I just paid six dollars for this game i can't really play on on the device that i have and now i'm super sad and even though it has some of my legitimately favorite games you know it's got a a remake of star ocean the second story one of my favorite games it's got a remake of the the first star ocean great game uh it's got a valkyrie profile remake beautiful game uh it's it's got castlevania the Dracula X Chronicles, which is uh, a remake, of, which is a remake is, yeah. of Castlevania. I, uh, but you know, I haven't touched it in months because of that experience. Mm. I've actually been playing a lot more my Vita. Um, it's a nice little device to have on the light rail. I've been playing a game called The Swindle. But w- what I do like about it is the Do you like your Vita when you get on the light rail so yes. that nobody tries to take it? Yeah, I do. Um, I like uh, I like the crossplay feature. I bought Minecraft on the PS4. No, no, I'm sorry. I bought it on the Vita, and then it was cheaper. It was like $5 extra. I can buy the PS4. I, I bought Minecraft on the PS4, and it was free on the Vita when I got my Vita. When I bought the Vita, though, I had to pay an extra $5 to get the PS4 version because it was scaling up. Yeah. But uh, there are games like The Swindle that, or even Hotline Miami. You buy one version, you get the uh, version that goes with it. I have Wild Arms on my Vita. Which which version? Just the original Wild the Arms? The original PlayStation version. It's Which, which is, is the like, superior version. Uh, yeah. You're wrong, <laughs> but it's still a fantastically beautiful game. So, you know, it, it's it's kind of like, would I rather drive the Rolls Royce or the Jaguar today? Uh, really, if you're asking this question, you're a dick anyway. So. Yeah. <laughs> if you are comparing a Rolls Royce to a Jaguar... <laughs> Got your priorities out of whack, my friend. Yeah, right. <laughs> With that, though, I think I'm going to call for a break. And, uh, of course, you know, thank Wheelie 2XAA. Um, of course, you can uh, check out the podcast, obviously, on Retrovolve. Um, we're also on halfglassgaming.com, where you can get a listing of games that we talk about in each episode, which is kind of cool. Um, you can also find us on iTunes, uh, where you can give us preferably a uh, five-star rating. Um, make some comments there and uh, help us become the best bot podcast of 2016. So with that, uh, we're going to go to our break. Um, we're going to hold hands, and then when we come back, we're going to talk about handhelds. Boom. So we're uh, back from the break, and I want to apologize formally for my sweaty palms. It was no fun holding my hand, I imagine. So with that, we're going to talk about some handhelds. (laughs) Yes, we are. (laughs) Obviously, for me, the first official handheld that I will recognize is the Game Boy, but uh, obviously I think it uh, harkens back further than that. I don't even think I know what the first handheld you could consider the first handheld. Well, it's kind of weird because they started with uh, just non-TV games that weren't really handheld games in the sense we think of them. The first non-TV video game was the Craigstein Periscope, which mm-hmm. came out in 1951. Hmm. And it was like a little... 1951. Peri- 1951. It was a little periscope that you could hook up and it had a screen that played the electronic game. So it was like you're in a... Peri- kind of like the Virtual Boy. Yeah, when, did the, when did the Magnavox Odyssey come out? Wasn't that in the 60s? That was in the 70s. And wasn't the Odyssey considered the first home console? And if it was, that that means we had, you know, what you could consider a handheld 
decades before we had the first home console. And that, that's just an interesting thing. Mm-hmm. Well, I wouldn't call it a handheld per se. One could make the argument that it is. Well, I think it was a handheld game and not a yeah. handheld gaming console. No, the first... Well, well right. So it had like a screen that displayed <laughs> images? Yes. Hmm. It wasn't portable, though. It was like a tabletop toy. Uh Did you just look into it and it showed you things, or did you actually interact with it? I can try and get some pictures. It's really hard to get anything but the box because it's so old. I don't even know that there's a working one We're all fascinated by this. Yeah. It's a fascinating thing. I did not realize that a tabletop thing that was an electronic game in any kind of fashion existed in the 1950s. Yeah. Like, that blows my mind. It's just so old that yeah. I don't even think there's a working looks one like that a, exists uh, anymore. Looks like a PKE reader, right? Something like that. Yeah, but so like that's that's really nifty. And then there's a later one where you didn't have to use the eyepiece, mm-hmm. but that one nice. came out in the '60s. Hmm. Gaming technology—it's older than we think it is sometimes. Yeah, because the first place I would go to for handheld gaming devices before I knew about this would have been the time of like the Nintendo Game and Watch, which I know wasn't even wasn't even the first handheld gaming device, but it was among the first that got popular, mm-hmm. I believe. Well, I think you can argue then for the Milton Bradley Microvision. Yeah, the Milton Bradley Microvision was the first handheld console that used cartridges and didn't just play a single game. Tell me about that one, please, Mandy, because I would like to know. The Microvision was released in 1979, so Mm -hmm. it just barely predates the Game & Watch, and they actually have identical origin stories in that they both started with somebody on a train watching somebody play with a calculator and thinking, oh, I bet I can make a video game like that. So independently in Two separate countries. Two people had the same idea, both based on watching people play with calculators on mm-hmm. a train. Mm-hmm. And That's entertaining. They both developed very different handheld game consoles. Yeah. Yeah, because I think the calculator is probably a good place to start. I mean, who didn't write boobies on there? <laughs> you know, come on. You said you could say hello. You could do you could do a lot with a but, basic uh, calculator. Jay Smith and then Gumpa Yokoi both had the same idea, mm-hmm. both based on calculators. And uh, they were both on the train. Yeah, both on the train, Man. according in interviews. But uh, Jay Smith. I guess thought of this way before, but it took him years and years to even Mm -hmm. convince anybody that this should be a thing. Sounds like some sort of a weird trigonometry (laughs) problem. (laughs) But uh, I I read an interview with him where he was just talking about going to pitch meetings and Mm -hmm. getting turned down and rebuilding his pitch and doing another pitch meeting and getting turned down. Mm -hmm. Do you think at some point he made a pitch to Gunpei Yokoi? (laughs) It was like, (laughs) Gunpei Yokoi is like, that's a great idea. Stop the train! Thank, thank God he told me about it before he got it made. Yeah, but I mean, in, in the... Well, the Thomas Edison. You're right. The Microvision wasn't successful by the standards we judge a lot of consoles, but it made $15 million in its first year, yeah, which is it was, 1979, $15 million, so that's, that's an enormous amount idea. of money. Yeah. See, and, now, and now I'm kind of wondering, because, like, okay, so... I think it's easy to say that the Nintendo Game & Watch historically was the more popular device. It's the one that we still know about more most readily. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's the one that people, you know, might recall. The one it, that has a character in Super the, Smash Brothers. It, right. We don't have any Microvision characters in Super Smash Brothers. Well, I think, I mean, but, could you say for the Microvision that it was just ahead of its time? Well, see, and that's what I was about to, to get into. Like, because so do you think if... Jay Smith had gotten someone to approve his pitch, you know, three or four years before, Mm -hmm. suddenly Milton Bradley would be a bigger name in gaming. Mm -hmm. Or do you think people would have been like, eh, whatever, and it would have just been ahead of its time, like like the Power Glove or like so many other devices (laughs) The Power Glove, so ahead of its time. One of the issues with the Microvision was that it had screen rot issues because to, in order to build it, a console, a device like that with affordable parts, mm-hmm. you had to cut corners. And so it wasn't built at the quality that Nintendo devices mm-hmm. are usually built because anybody who's owned a Nintendo device knows that those things can last forever mm-hmm. or at least can withstand a lot. Yeah, that's and true. And so, uh, I mean, the Microvision, there's are almost none that are anymore in existence that are even playable. Mm-hmm. Their screens failed. The cartridges stopped working early on. So I don't think it would have had that longevity just because they couldn't get the money to get yeah. high quality enough parts. Mm-hmm. But, you know, then the question becomes, if it had gotten approved a few years before, would it have been popular enough that it would have been worth giving that? A, like, like so, so what if 
the microvision had gotten approved and made when Jay Smith first started making the pitch, as opposed to waiting so long and then Nintendo, uh, you know, getting out there at around the same time. Yeah, to be fair, it took Gumpei Yokoi a long time too. I believe he first pitched the Game and Watch in 1977, mm-hmm. and it didn't release until 1980. Is it just that people weren't ready to carry around a devoted device with cartridges, and a guy still got his newspaper cur- curled up doing the crossword? Last thing he's going to want to yeah, do. Yeah, and I mean, get a- I think people were still their primary association with video games at that time was still arcades. Mm-hmm. I mean, perhaps it could even have been a price point issue. I mean, who's I to say would how much almost this thing would have cost. <laughs> I mean, to have made fifteen million dollars in nineteen seventy nine, nineteen eighty. That's, that's probably not a small amount. Twelve hundred dollars per unit to buy. Yeah, um, the microvision cost a hundred dollars a unit wow. at lunchtime in nineteen seventy nine. Nineteen seventy nine, jeez. Which is just about on par with the launch price of the Game Boy ten years later. Mm-hmm. So you go from that. At the same time, you get this Game and Watch, which ultimately, I guess, could lead to like the Tiger Market, which I'm sure we're all intimately familiar with. I the Tiger Market was what you got when your parents didn't want to spend money on a Game Boy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're like twelve dollars. And you're in Walg- Walgreens or Target. Right. Yeah. I I had the one for the the Hook movie. Let's not sell them short. For what they were, a lot of those Tiger games were yeah. entertaining. I had Double Dragon, multiple levels. I mean, you know, yeah, I, I played the crap out of out of Hook. There's a level. I, where stalactites fall from the ceiling and injure you. I mean, that, you're right. that's brilliant. That makes perfect sense in Double Dragon. Of course it does. Exactly what you're looking for. Of course. I, I had a Beauty and the Beast one that mm-hmm. I still have fond memories of because, of course, I had a Disney princess game. The one where you threw roses. <laughs> Back when I was in elementary school, there's a kid who who found somewhere on the playground or something or on the sidewalk somewhere. It was called Mario's Cement Factory. Mm-hmm. And it was like Weird. a Nintendo handheld unit that just had that one game on it. Mm-hmm. And I remember he and I would just play the crap out of it. He was like, oh, sweet, we can play Mario at school. Yeah. And- Do you guys and gals remember um, those old toys? Uh, it, it, I mean, it basically was like a Game Boy or something, but it had no electronics in it. It was just a oh, scrolling like, <laughs> yes. road and a plastic <laughs> car that you would yeah, turn yes. the steering wheel <laughs> left to right to try to navigate. That was... That was- about as low brow <laughs> as you could get. But the graphics. <laughs> Very realistic <laughs> graphics. I no, I've, re- I've recently uh, discovered that there was a thing, quote unquote, a console, but you would hook it up to your TV and it had a car like kind of hanging from a string. <laughs> okay. And, I'm it, with you. <laughs> and you would put in a VHS tape of like a car driving and then you would drive your car with a little steering wheel and it would like go back and forth in front of your TV screen. Yeah, that's wonderful. Fantastic. It was called Video Driver, and it yeah. was actually made by Sega. My life is better knowing that such a thing exists existed. So then finally, the culminating moment in human history, the creation of the Game Boy. I think everybody had a big gray brick. I know I got one when I was a kid. I still have mine. I don't, because every Game Boy I've ever had have been stolen. Uh, the first Game Boy I ever had was a, a gray brick uh, they got stolen, along with my copy of Final Fantasy Legends, which I still love to this day, that game. Mm-hmm. Uh, that got stolen at a Christian teen event. Mm-hmm. Uh, my second Game Boy, uh, it got lost in a move when I was helping a friend of mine move. But yeah, it got stolen. Uh, my my third Game Boy, uh, another Game Boy Advance uh, that I bought when leaving El Paso to move to Indianapolis right before I wound up homeless. That got stolen along with some of my other stuff when I was homeless. Uh, then I had a Nintendo DS with Pokemon Heart Gold that I put so much time in. I had every evolution in that game, including the ones that aren't in Heart Gold. I had to trade for it. I had an official Mew, and that thing got stolen. You do not understand the depths of my sadness. I've seen some tears. I yeah. I had an. It was a. It wasn't a Game Shark Mew. It was an official Mew from Nintendo. His eyes are getting a little sparkly. Yeah. So what is it like? 1989. The original Game Boy comes out. We're all just babes, and it just explodes. It terraformed. Well, yours exploded. It did. <laughs> <laughs> and it terraformed my body with battery acid. But <laughs> So this just changes the landscape of everything, right? Julian's Game Boy changed the landscape of Julian. Of his crotch area. <laughs> my crotch area is not the same. It's still smoking hot, though, because battery acid. Burnt. Anyway, so <laughs> this thing is an incredible success. What kind of numbers are we looking at here, Mandy? 
Uh, Game Boy is sold over 118 million worldwide, the original Game Boy. That so is, that's not counting its successors. That's mind boggling. And that's not including like the Game Boy Color or any of that? Including the Game Boy Pocket, but not okay. Game Boy Color or so, anything yeah, like that. The redesign. Yeah. So yeah. the redesign of the original brick is included in that, but mm-hmm. not the Game Boy Color or any of its other successors. Mm-hmm. How many of us still have a working Game Boy? I do. The gray yeah, brick. Yeah. I have I have a working gray brick. It's and, yellow now, but uh, yeah, and okay. I have a working Game Boy Color. I, not only that, I still have the original Double Dragon that I had for it, the TMNT, and my copy of Metroid 2. But so, the original Game Boy, it's a behemoth. It's a colossi for within which we stand in its shadow. It's not really a technical... You know, Technically, it's not a giant. It's no. A- no, it's I not mean, a the Game Boy, <laughs> the Game Gear released one year after the Game Boy with yeah. full color graphics. Full color. It, wasn't it 16-bit full graphics on the Game color. Gear? Game Gear was 8-bit graphics. Okay. But, of course, the, the difference here is that the Game Gear was a lot more expensive. And I feel like it was more fragile than the Grey Brick Game Boy. There's no question that the Game Boy was the fan favorite. Na- name a Game Boy game that you loved. Oh, I mean, Kirby, uh, Metroid... I, I actually liked the Mario 2 and 3. You know, Tetris, Link's Awakening. Tetris, okay. Mar- Mario, Mario 2 was probably one of the best Mario games, even to this yeah. date. Yeah. Now name a Game Gear game that you loved. Lunar Walking School. Columns? <laughs> <laughs> was Columns on the Game Gear? Yes, it was. Was it? I, I what's, did... your, what's this Lunar Walking School game? It's about a game where you walk to school set before Whoa. Lunar Silver Story. <laughs> Is this the first walking simulator? (laughs) (laughs) It's an RPG, and you have to walk to this magic school, and the magic school can fly, and it travels from location to location, and then bridges appear. So you have to journey to the school, and then you get there, and all the teachers are gone, and the school is deserted, and so you and the other students have to figure out what happened Mm -hmm. so you can go to magic school. Hmm. That sounds a lot like a lot of fun, and if I had known that game existed, I might own a game. It was never released in North America. Yeah. Well, that explains a few things. Yeah, but I I feel like Josh's point is is valid. You know, well, like like with so many Sega systems, it was this technological marvel for mm-hmm. its time that just didn't have enough game backing. The original Game Boy could have only played Tetris, and I would have been fine with that. Yeah, it shipped to Tetris. And, oh yeah, I'm saying you know it had Tetris. And then it had Kirby, which was the first game I had. Mm -hmm. And then it had, you know, just you can, you already named like five games just off the top of your head Mm -hmm. that you wanted for the Game Boy. Mm I had fun playing the Game Gear seg- uh, Sonic game, mm-hmm. but I think Josh's commentary is valid. There wasn't a lot of really good games on the Game Gear. And then you get into it was more expensive. It, it was shaped weird. It was more fragile. Took, like, you know, 5,000 like, batteries. It, right. Like, I I think everyone Link's Awakening seen, on that thing just, oh, man. No way. Never would have happened. No. <laughs> um, Link's I, Awakening, good night. <laughs> The Game Boy was also more durable, well, which it, meant that you weren't, weren't out all the money that you just spent. And there was also a intent to sort of reach out to female gamers. Yeah, I was actually, I found an old newspaper article from the 90s with a bunch of data that Nintendo had about their players, and 46% of Game Boy players were female. That's insane. To yeah, me. at the at the time, yeah, because on their consoles, some of them were less than 20%, because mm-hmm. at that time, game systems were marketed so heavily towards boys Mm -hmm. and even the game boy was Mm -hmm. but it every ad i mean and but it really resonated with female gamers Mm -hmm. so according to nintendo's data in 1994 46 percent of people playing game boys were female then pokemon came out and that was all she wrote for any handheld gaming device well, that wasn't Nintendo. Mm-hmm. Well, po- yeah, Pokemon, Pokemon came out Pokemon came Japan. out years in Japan before it came out here. Yeah, yeah once everybody once... caught them all over there, they were like, okay, now we can... Yeah, right. I mean, it had the devoted sequel to Metroid. It, it had that. Right? It had its own 
incredible Zelda game. It had games that were part of these franchises that we had already learned to love, your Mario games, your mm-hmm. Zelda games, that by themselves were really solid inclusions into the franchise. But they weren't like knockoff games either, because right. even if no. you if you look at handheld games that are coming out, like look at the handheld Call of Duty game yeah. or the handheld Resistance game, like they're garbage. Yeah. They're like, oh, let's port these out to a third party studio and yeah. let's give them a very small budget and just, you know, see what they can do. Mm -hmm. and we'll just stamp this name on it so this game sells. Like, you know, The Link's Awakening is... Is a Zelda game. Mm -hmm. One of the the best Zelda games. Did Kirby originate on on the Game Boy? It did. I mean, that's that's a huge uh, Nintendo property to this day. And I mean, that's not to say that, you know, the Game Gear was complete shit. No, I, you know, I had fun with my friend's Game Gear. Yeah. You know, it had a Lion King game that I had a lot of fun with. Yeah. I mean, you know, just even... Being able to play Sonic on the go is pretty cool. I right. Mean. And I, I recall uh, I took a road trip with my grandparents one year uh, when Howard Johnson was mm-hmm. doing a, a promotion where if you stayed, you know, with the, the Howard Johnson Hotel, they would let you rent a Game Gear. That made me try to convince my grandparents to stay at a Howard Johnson on mm-hmm. our road trip, which mm-hmm. they did. And then I played that Game Gear, you know, for hours because it was a lot of fun. But, you know, it didn't get me to want to buy a Game Gear. Okay, so you got the Nintendo. The Game Boy just rockets into space. It literally did rocket into space, actually. Yeah, no, I, I wasn't making a, a joke there. There was a cosmonaut who brought it up to space with mm-hmm. them. So you got the Lynx. You got con- handheld consoles that kind of come out. The the Atari Lynx actually came out the same year as the Game Boy. Is that right? Yes. That's interesting. So 1989. Why do you think it didn't take off? Because that actually was a piece of shit. <laughs> well, <laughs> because the Game Boy. Yeah. I mean, what else do you need? Nintendo, I mean, they're flourishing in the handheld market. More so than the whole Systems company. are successful here, but it's really a pretty small market compared to the handheld market in Japan. In uh, Japan right now, consoles are actually really struggling because so many people use handhelds as their primary gaming system. Japan has a commuter culture. Uh, most students will take the train to go to school. Most people will take the train to go to work and will be spending an hour or more on a train every day so it just makes sense to use that time on your hobbies uh, mm-hmm. the mo- the best selling game in Japan in 2015 was actually Monster Hunter X on the mm-hmm. 3DS that's a multiplayer game that uses local multiplayer so people can get together on the train and all play Monster Hunter on their handhelds together while they're going to school or work oh that's cool Monster Hunter is certainly successful here but not mm-hmm. a major not a bestseller so right. it's something Thing that's really unique to handheld culture in Japan and how they enjoy those devices there. Hmm. It it makes me think of like going to conventions and seeing just groups of people hanging out in the lobby of the hotel or whatever, uh, playing Animal Crossing on their 3DS because you know it's kind of the same thing. Well, I think, and I guess I don't know how it is in Japan, but I think here specifically, mobile, you know, cell phone games have kind of taken over a devoted handheld platform. Well, I mean, the Vita has struggled, but the 3DS's sales are still huge here. Mm-hmm. I don't, I don't think it's accurate to say that handheld gaming is niche here. It's just a small market compared to Japan as well. Mm-hmm. And uh, the Vita is certainly struggling, which is a shame because it's a great system. But yeah, it's not bad. I, I never uh, see anybody playing a. DS or a Vita really anywhere in public. Mobile gaming and handheld gaming are definitely different niches. And I think I think mobile gaming, the 3DS and the Vita, all three each have their own niche. Uh, the problem with the Vita is that people don't really understand that <laughs> particular niche. But like, you know, your mobile game is like your candle, Candy mm-hmm. Crush or your, you know, things of that nature, Bejeweled Blitz, where it's like, okay, I've got you know, 45 seconds as I'm standing in line, Mm -hmm. here's a thing I can do. Um, Whereas 3DS is going to be more about games that you can play in short bursts, but are also enjoyable for longer periods of time. And uh, the PlayStation Vita is supposed is more supposed to be like a companion to your PS4, and they really they really wanted uh, a hardcore gaming handheld console, uh, which I think is kind of mixing up target demographics a little bit, and I think that's part of its you know lack of success. Mm-hmm. 
well, the hardcore crowd wants to be at home mm-hmm. with their Cheetos and their yeah, Big their Balls McNutter Squash. Big ball, yeah, right. Your <laughs> or Big Cobra Balls Agnes. McNutter Squash doesn't want yeah. a handheld console. He no. wants a... Or more generously, perhaps, the dedicated gamers uh, want the kind of hardware and size and etc. that comes with a home console. Because, you know, a, a handheld just isn't going to be able to do the things that uh, a television console can do. It's, mm-hmm. it's a different device. It's a different kind of hardware. Well, well like, the Vita's powerful for a handheld. But right. It's but like, for a handheld. if you want something powerful, you don't want a handheld. You right. I think like, but I think, like, what was nice about the PSP is that it, it offered this alternative platform for games that perhaps wouldn't perform that well sales-wise on a console. Uh, maybe i mean you know jrpgs flourished on the psp you know that was why i went out of my way to get a psp because it had a lot of jrpgs that i wanted Mm -hmm. but i mean it goes back to you know the the game boy argument it's like look at the ds game library look at the 3ds game library and then look at the vita's game library the thing is the vita's game library is uh, heavily impacted by the fact that it was only really successful in japan Mm. uh the vita has outsold every current gen console in japan uh, continues to outsell it month to month wow, uh that's in, impressive that is in december 2015 the vita outsold every console sales that month combined so the vita is not a failure in japan Whoa. and it has a huge library of games that are catered to interests in japan mm-hmm that are original games exclusive to the Vita. And a lot of the stuff that comes here that's skewed more towards Western interests might be ports and Vita versions mm-hmm. of certain games, but there are games like, for example, the Danganronpa games that you can only play on the Vita that are Japanese-developed games catered more towards Japanese interests. Yeah, I think the U.S. market, they try to just say, well, you know, let's make it Uncharted. So it's like, well, I'll just play a better version on my home console. Weirdly, the uh, the Vita the Vita version of Uncharted or the Vita Uncharted game had or like the gunplay, especially mm-hmm. like the gunplay controls on the uh, on the Vita were were really great, mm-hmm. and a lot of people were complaining about Uncharted Three having bad gunplay. A lot of like the jumping stuff and the climbing stuff felt better on the PS3, but mm-hmm. the gunplay was way better on the Vita, and that was probably the best part about that game. So hearing that information about the Vita makes me curious about the PSP because my understanding was that the PSP was not didn't do very well here in the states and I might be completely wrong but that was my understanding was it a similar thing with the PSP where like there's a lot of Japanese stuff the PSP did significantly better in the US than the Vita did it actually did quite well Mm -hmm. it's just that uh, I think a lot of people bought PSPs and didn't buy a lot of games for it Mm -hmm. and so then the game library dried up the the thing I remember the most about the PSP was people making jokes about the UMD uh, format so it, it might also be just a matter of perception over what actually happened yeah i think with the vita you know especially with the touch capabilities it offers a more unique option for developers you know games like tearaway um and p in the psp perhaps just didn't necessarily have that sort of a feature the butt touching the butt touching you can touch the butt of your vita yeah you know i mean and it responds it does in kind. But then they released the PSP Go, which didn't make a whole lot of sense, and I think kind of killed market for that. And uh, then they came out with the Vita, which I think is pretty cool. I like playing um, my uh, PSP version, the digital version of the PSP game, um, MTV Beta Raider on my Vita, kind of just going around making beats in my headphones. And uh, But there's actually a, 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 you know, a really solid underground chiptune scene with the uh, Game Boys and such. So chiptune is basically, it takes Taking an old retro game console and using its synthesizer chip to make music. You know, now we can record, like go out to a recording studio and record sound and put it into our games. But when you're looking at an 8-bit console like the NES, it had a synthesizer chip in it and it was synthesizing the sounds that you heard. Uh, the Game Boy actually had, for 1989, had a very advanced synthesizer chip in it and people have created software now so you can you know, plug a cartridge into your Game Boy and use it as, as a music synthesizer Mm -hmm. and obviously everything's an 8-bit it's like 8-bit sounds and so you've got all these chiptune musicians making you know crazy dance music with game boy 
Boys. Mm-hmm. And because because of the Game Boy's portable, it uh, is a lot easier to use than like, you know, chip tuning on an NES. So, you know, I think I think part of that is driving a lot of retro unit sales a lot of people like rebuying old game boys mm-hmm. and things and has you know driven up the value and the cost of trying to get your hands on an old gray block yeah um but these people like do I've, I've talked to you know i've talked to a bunch of them i used to do a bunch of chip tuning i made a bunch of friends and stuff actually wheelie the uh the guy who does music for our uh for this podcast or <laughs> our break music uh, i met him in you know doing 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 the chiptune stuff and mm-hmm. you know that's how we came in, into contact with each other originally uh we we did some songs together and stuff at one point but um people actually mod their game boys so that they kick out more ba- bass so that they have a higher fidelity you know audio output and stuff like that mm-hmm. you're you're outputting your music into a headphones jack and so they found ways to to get better uh, output fidelity and things like that. Hmm. And it's it's a fascinating thing. Mm-hmm. Like and once once you get into it, like you get into it, and it's yeah, it's it's pretty crazy. You know, I've been sitting here this whole time, kind of thinking about uh, the Vita Remote Play, which kind of leads me to question the history of handheld console connectivity. Isn't something that I think a lot about but uh i know there's you know you can connect game boys together and kind of play games like that i mean it depends on how you define it there was the super game boy for the super nes where you yeah. could play game boy cartridges on I the had TV, one of which i used all the time and add color schemes but uh nintendo really started to push it heavily during the gamecube era mm-hmm. a lot of games uh required using the link cable to link up the game boy advance to the gamecube in order to experience all the features hmm. for example and Animal Crossing on the GameCube okay. had an entire island you could only access if you linked up your Game Boy Advance. There's Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles, which yeah, was that's exactly much, what I was thinking about. It, like it was pretty much unplayable non-multiplayer. I mean, you could play it, mm-hmm. and it was playable, but it was clearly designed for multiplayer. But even the, like the Gray Block Game Boy had the connector cable that you would run between two Game Boys, so you could do multiplayer and stuff like that. But I don't right, think. Right. I don't think it was a heavily utilized feature. Well, actually, the PSP, you could run up um, to your television. They had like a cable that you run into your TV so you can play your PSP games on your TV when you're at home. Well, folks, kids, I think that's it. I think we've reached the end of an episode. We didn't We didn't even realize that it happened. Yeah. It was just so sudden. Uh-huh. The writing was not in the sky. <laughs> <laughs> Pages of the Elder Scroll cast off by the Morrowind. <laughs> Entertaining trivia, the Elder Scrolls themselves weren't actually things until uh, Oblivion. Hmm. So, like, here was this series named after a thing that didn't actually exist in the game until the fourth installment. Well, they needed an excuse to, to see what Mojang... That's a fun fact for you there. So uh, Mojang yeah. created a game called Scrolls, and Bethesda sued them. <laughs> it was a huge deal for a while, where Bethesda was like, ah, you can't call your game Scrolls, because our game's called The Elder Scrolls, and it's too similar, and people are going to get confused. And so there was a big lawsuit, and then Notch uh, released a statement that was like, you know what, like, why don't we, I don't remember what game it was. It was like Quake 2 or something. He's like, why don't we settle this over a game of Quake 2? Oh, yeah, that sounds familiar. He, like, he challenged the Bethesda developers to to a Quake duel, and obviously they didn't take him up on it, but yeah, they the money. Mojang won the lawsuit anyway. I want I want more developers and programmers and uh, journalists and etc. in the gaming community to do that. Instead of going to lawsuits, let's let's just, you know, have a game of Mario Kart, uh, Super Smash Brothers, a whatever. game of Berserk. A game of Berserk. <laughs> Who, whoever dies of a heart attack first loses. <laughs> There was just a, a game for the PS Plus 3 game. That was some tank game, World War One patent, something or other. But there's a similar titled game that's also a handheld tank World War One patent game. So that one was inadvertently released free until they realized that wasn't the right game. So then they took that off and put the, the actual one up there. So you could have gotten a free game and they didn't take it back from you because they said, our bad, you know. Mm, fair enough. But uh, yeah, so anyways... Um, that was a, uh, a digression of sorts. And uh, so, look, handheld games. Man, I don't know where to go with this. You know, we're uh, we're running out of steam. and uh, That's what I want. I want a handheld steam device. There you go. That's where the future of handheld should go. Mm, half-class gaming. Out.
Um, that plane you hear is actually uh, something we're new that we're rolling out where we just attach banners with the uh, postscript of the show um, so you can read it in the sky. Um, and all our <laughs> Witcher 3 comments. We have people skywriting our yep. episode transcripts. Yep, and that's part of the Witcher Watch. It takes up a lot of sky. It, it does. It takes up a tremendous amount the, the of The Witcher sky. commentary alone, yeah. really. And it's, it's become a no man's sky up there, really. <laughs> <laughs> that one was actually pretty good. Yeah, it's a bit of a Skylanders. <laughs> Now you're pushing it. They're they're just on they're just on the edge of the sky. It's the, <laughs> the really, of the sky. really, hold on. No, I've got this, and none of you are gonna get it. <clears throat> really, what's great is that they're just sky blazing up there. None of you know what sky blazer is. No, we don't. It's really too bad.